have uh, many opportunities to use this experience in their uh, furtherment of their careers. Thank you. The end of the mole program turned out to be as low key as its beginning. Six weeks later, the world focused on man's role in space, but they were watching Neil Armstrong step foot on the moon. Oh, that looks beautiful from here, Neil. It has a stark beauty all its own. The world was unified at that point, and I think everybody was happy that a human being had landed on another planet. By the same token, I would say that I still cry at night a little bit about not getting to go. The Americans had just landed on the moon in 1969, which was probably the greatest event in the history of space exploration so far. The Russians had completely been upstage. They'd lost the moon race. So Dmitry Ustinov, who's basically the effective head of the Soviet space program, demands something to respond to this. This is what the Russians came up with. This is the spy station called Almaz. Thirteen years in the making, the sole remaining capsule is locked away in a warehouse on the outskirts of Moscow. It is a closed facility, a place foreigners are still denied access. Nova's cameras were allowed inside, but only with a Russian camera crew. The Almaz capsule was divided in three sections. One section was the crew quarters, a rudimentary bed, a table where cosmonauts could sit and prepare food, a tank to sip water from. Another section was mainly taken up with the sensors. Largest among them, the Agat camera, weighing more than two tons with six meter mirrors folded inside and in the middle, the operations module, where astro spies could zoom down to almost any point on Earth. To show them where they were, a simple globe that depicted their point in orbit, a screen they look at that showed them a hundred kilometer panorama of the world below. In front of that screen, a viewfinder that could zoom in to 100 meters. We could see details that were half a meter long from 250 kilometers in outer space. For example, we could see the make of the car, if it's a Ford or Toyota. The entire station was gyroscopically controlled, designed to pivot as it passed over its target, so that when the shutter was triggered, the pictures wouldn't be blurred. And on the outside of the station, a first for manned spaceflight. A weapon. A 23 millimeter cannon that could fire on an enemy satellite that might be flying too close for comfort. In June 1974, all of this was loaded on top of a giant proton rocket and rolled out to the Baikonur launch site. The Almaz capsule was covered with a shroud so American reconnaissance satellites couldn't photograph it. Nine days later, Colonel Pavel Popovich and his flight engineer, Lieutenant Colonel Yuri Artukin, were launched into space to dock with the Alma station. They were the first astro spies to orbit the Earth. Their mission lasted 15 days. Valery Romanov is a cosmonaut who trained on the Almaz program in the 1970s. Inside the command center, he demonstrates how Popovich's mission worked. These are the synchronization levers. By pushing the button, we could switch on the camera. But the process itself went like this. Here is the panoramic screen where I can see the ground beneath the station. And this is how I zoom in. So, for example, I'm flying over the ocean and I spot warship. I can see it's going a little bit to the right, so I can rotate the station a little to keep watching it and then film it. One, two, three, and I have a picture. We had a special system to develop the film. 
you turned off all the station's lights and in complete darkness you put the film in the developer then moved out a projection table to fix the exposed film then you could select the most interesting parts and transmit it back to earth with a video camera so about an hour after you took a picture people on earth could be studying it now let me show you the periscope and how it could protect you from attack if you look through here you can see outside the station and what's happening around it ground control can tell me something is going on if something is approaching here and that might be a killer satellite we have the noodleman cannon right below the station's belly so I try to rotate the station to face the object head-on and then feed in the command to fire fortunately that never happened we were afraid about what would happen to the station if we fired the cannon so we never tested it with the man on board but after the crew left we fired the cannon by remote control and the station survived the intense vibration subsequent missions to the almaz seemed star-crossed on two missions cosmonauts failed to dock with the spy station and returned to earth empty-handed on the third attempt to reach Almaz, things got worse. The cosmonauts docked successfully and entered the Almaz. But on their 42nd day in orbit, as they passed over the dark side of Earth, the station's electrical system suddenly shut down. Alarms sounded, and the station was plunged into darkness. Out of radio contact and drifting in space, the cosmonauts struggled for two hours to bring the craft back to life. When power was restored, the frailty of man in space became clear. The flight engineer suffered a breakdown and began experiencing audio hallucinations. No medicine on board could help. Six days later, the cosmonauts were ordered back to Earth. In February 1977, Viktor Gorbatko, a Soviet Air Force colonel, was the last pilot to command Almaz. His mission was almost flawless. When we flew over the United States, I looked down and immediately recognized New York. We could see human beings on the street. I would say we could see object about one meter in size. I had enough time to count planes on the ground when we flew over military bases. We just had to shoot film of any weapons we could spot. That was about all we had to do. Circling the Earth every 90 minutes, he said the Almaz orbit was useful not only for spying on the U.S., but also on its allies. Yeah. Our main assignment with the Agat system was to film ships and planes on the other side. There was some military tension in Israel, so we had to count how many planes they had. To Colonel Gorbatko, there was a big difference between space espionage and space wars. My mission has a peaceful character. We didn't shoot, we just took pictures. So we were space spies. That would be a good title for your movie. But far below, in Moscow, senior Kremlin officials were asking the same question their American counterparts asked eight years before. Was this really worth the effort and the risk? One of the biggest ironies here was that the Russians probably felt that they won. But in the end, it was a hollow victory because they ended up basically uh, coming to the same conclusion. It just took them about a decade longer. On February 25, 1977, at 9.21 a.m. Moscow time, Colonel Gorbatko undocked from Almaz and descended towards central Kazakhstan. He and his partner would be the last Astro spies. After 13 years of extraordinary effort by scientists from both sides, 
with billions of rubles and billions of dollars spent.